Hello and welcome to the Scuttlebutt Podcast. I'm your host, Brock Briggs, and each week I bring you a conversation with a current or former service member at the top of their craft. These conversations will make you smarter, they'll help you explore new ideas that challenge you personally and professionally, and it'll make you more money. Today I'm speaking with Josh Smith, former EOD tech and now the owner of a large welding and fabrication business. We talk about how his business is looking to adopt e-commerce strategies and the pros and cons of customization versus mass adoption. He walks us through his first acquisition, everything that went wrong with it, and how to avoid some of those pitfalls. And we talk about his strategies for recruiting top trade talent and cultivating an environment that retains highly skilled people. You can find this episode of the podcast, as well as all other SMB-focused episodes, transcripts, the weekly newsletter, and the YouTube channel, all at scuttlebuttpodcast.co. Please enjoy this episode with Josh Smith. So today, right, like... (laughs) <laughs> well, I've been like experimenting with, you know, trying to, I guess, approach different business models in the metal fabrication space and mini manufacturing and things like that. And the the biggest problem, well, let, me, let me not say problem, because problem implies that it's 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 causing some angst or something like that. But the biggest hindrance that I've seen so far is that, you know, since things are custom, right, there is a lot of uh, flexibility. And, 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 and this might not make sense, but some a business model can be so flexible that it's rigid. Like there's not a lot of places to go with it, you know what I mean, that are profitable. And, you know, a big part of kind of like what it is that I do is more, you know, trying to brainstorm and find the best solution and, and, so that's been like wrecking my brain all day. And then I have people that are giving me like these different ideas in uh, terms of business models that we're seeing in like on demand made to spec fabrication. Right. And, you know, they're treating it like a e-commerce business. And I'm just like, you know, the old school way of doing it is somebody shows up to your shop. They got some plans. They got a CAD drawing and you build a spec. They come, you know, you make sure the specs are in line you hand them off this product, you get paid and that's it. Right. But, you know, my thing is just trying to figure out how to incorporate, you know, more of what I'm seeing, which is kind of an e-commerce model into it and making sure the business model makes sense. So that is like, (laughs) that is the thing right now for me. Yeah. The way that you described like the, the traditional way of doing things is kind of how I imagined that business to be operated under. Maybe could you kind of like explain how this could be applied to e-commerce? How can you operate under that type of business model doing like welding and fabrication? That doesn't seem to be something because it is so custom. For sure. Right. But like, okay, think about it like this. So one thing we do is we do a lot of analysis of what our requests are and even like what you know heavy like into the search uh understanding how you know what people are looking for to have made right so one thing in particular is barbecue grills okay now a lot of times people they have they have an idea in mind but you know trying to go sit down with a fabricator work it out get specs and all that other stuff is kind of time consuming right and what I've recently seen is like with the way certain companies are doing it in a kind of an e-commerce fashion is they have pre-made designs. Okay? Oh, okay. And there are, they have, you know, custom engines, um, customizable engines where people can go in and say, okay, I want to add a smoker or I want my stack pipe to be, you know, instead of a uh, two feet, I want to be five feet or something, just any, you know, any customization like that. And they're just able to go in plug and play and then press send, pay, deposit, whatever the case may be, get it built, you know, get a video of it, and then, you know, pay the final balance and get it shipped out to them, right? And it's very little interaction now with, you know, the fabricator uh, at all. It's more so you're dealing with, you know, their systems that they have in place, Uh, these kind of smart designers, if you will. Um, They have, like, some AI tools that are in place now. And, uh, like, things like AutoCAD and um, Autodesk and um, was it uh, Fusion 360, like those different computer aided uh, software packages that they're like implementing to build on demand. And it's like, (sighs) bro, that's that's incredible because I would have never thought of it like that, right? Like I come from like kind of old school, like with like my uncle, he would, 
you know, somebody wanted something built, he would, they would come to him, they would say, okay, I want it this big, and I want it to be, look like this, he would do a rough sketch, and then, you know, there was no computers involved, it was just, okay, this is going to look like this, it's going to be this wide, going to be this, and then he build it, you know, they would love it and move on from there, but this e-commerce thing is, is, is it's, I know that eventually it's going to lead there. And, you know, truthfully, I just don't want to be left behind when that does kick off, right? Like, you know, I like to think of myself as being on the cutting edge of things. And that's just kind of where I feel like <laughs> how I feel about it right now. You know, it's it's new, but you still have to prepare yourself for it because eventually it's going to come full, full force at you. I guess the natural question that I would have about something like that is, to implement something like that, that that would certainly imply that you have to make a lot of the same one item. So like you mentioned, like barbecues or smokers, like if you get 50 of those a month and maybe 90% of them are the exact same, mm-hmm. then you could really kind of like just play with just, hey, here's the base model and add like sure. a couple of different things. Do you sure. get that many requests that are for the same item and they're very very similar so this time of year yes like usually barbecue grills and um uh, fire pits like those are two things that are like this time of year where people are just like oh i want a custom fire pit or they'll want it um they'll want to have a it, like a uh a, a logo plasma cut into the side of it you know just different things like that's usually the only variation the design stays the same but in terms of the personalized thing that's where it kind of like changes and you know like you said like it would you would need to do a lot of one thing in order for that to make sense and that's another issue that i'm looking at because i don't want like especially right now with the way it costs of steel i don't want to be you know, trying to have like a million different uh, gauges and thickness of steel that I might use for one project or another. And, you know, that, but that's a part of figuring this out too, because it's like, okay, what makes sense in that particular, you know, does it make Mm -hmm. sense to keep X amount of stock for this? Because, you know, regardless of if I'm building the same thing, you know, we use this particular gauge of steel or this particular thickness of steel more often than not. Right. But, you know, it, (laughs) It's, it's a challenge that I'm working through. I'll say that. How do you think about drawing a line between custom work and like just almost all going in on all of one product? Because kind of what you're alluding to or whatever of like, if you are going to make a lot of something, you want to get really, really good at it. And mm-hmm. it kind of maybe begs the question of like, I don't know, maybe you just make fire pits and maybe it is a little bit seasonal, but maybe you have like one product like that is really does really well over the winter months or or however the seasonality of it works like is there is more of the money in custom versus like maybe something that's more mass produced with like minor customization like the putting their name on it or whatever it is right right right. so kind of like a real world scenario that's that that i could liken this to that applies to your question is we build a lot of steel brackets for uh, structural steel uh, in the local area. Now that's not really seasonal because they're building all over uh, the Virginia area. So we do those on a consistent basis and going all in on it doesn't necessarily make sense. You know, it still makes sense to keep our custom side because that allows for us to kind of keep, um, if you will, a varying, uh, a pretty high level of varying cash flow, right? And, you know, the custom parts, you kind of, at a certain point, you're basically, it's a race to the bottom because, you know, as you go over time, go over time, then it, you would assume that that price gets cheaper and cheaper because now you have your supplier on board uh, in terms of the raw material that you need to make it. Now you either have a dedicated tech a fabricator and a fitter that can go through and run through, do maybe, um, I think in our case, we are doing like, like close to like 50 a day and uh, like we have a weekly delivery of like i want to say closer to like 300 or something like that so it's it's a it's a balance in that right doesn't mean that i don't want to say that i would like to choose one or the other i just would find like try to you know make sure that we have a healthy balance like Mm because you can get pigeonholed fairly easy 
with trying to manufacture a a specific thing for your particular market because even if you have let's say like there's some guys i know who like ship out uh countrywide for you know they do a pretty decent size medium size like manufacturing operation but you know like like we're talking about seasonality some of those things are seasonal some of those things are market driven some of those things are <laughs> geopolitical driven and you'll 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 find yourself like oh snap because they got a buddy of mine when amazon stopped works here in Virginia. They stopped construction completely. He had, um, he was supplying them with uh, the steel beams and whatnot. Once they stopped construction, that just kind of stopped everything. And he had built infrastructure around that. And that's like always my biggest fear, building infrastructure around something that, you know, gets stopped for whatever reason. Because now you're like, okay, how do I pivot from that? It's hard to do so with raw materials and that type of spec, you know. Do the parts that maybe aren't affected by seasonality that are maybe more widely used, uh, like either in construction or something that like everybody could use that you wouldn't have a hard time selling, does that pigeonhole you because then you're like, you're maybe competing with bigger players, like where size and scale really matter? Yes, 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 yes. And the larger players, the, the, the larger players, they are efficient, man. Like they are efficient. Like there is, they usually, you know, they I like to say they're top heavy. So they'll come in with like the best machinery to get it done, you know, quick. Like whereas we might be producing this specific uh, this specific bracket fifty a day, they can you know end up producing maybe four or five hundred a day because they have had consultants and and all type of all type of process engineering and everything like that. So they can come in and get it really quickly so then you find yourself again at another race to the bottom <laughs> and, yeah. and it, it is not necessarily the best situation to be in now i'm not gonna sit there and try to speak through it as if i've been through that but i've seen it a few times so far and it ain't pretty yeah you definitely want to uh given the choice between price sensitive and price insensitive you want mm-hmm. uh, you want the the latter and uh, you want to be able to and i think in that line of work kind of that more custom work will probably always demand that and kind of attract that type of customer yeah like and even still like so whereas the larger like kind of corporate manufacturing and and sometimes it's not even corporate manufacturing sometimes it's just a larger player you know maybe a single uh owner without even a board or something like that like where they have the advantage on doing kind of the manufacturing side like uh consistently over and over doing the same pieces like the smaller players have have the huge advantage when it comes to custom because they're a lot more flexible you know what i mean so like again it's a balance act on their side and our side but you just you know like the, the the saying goes, get in where you fit in. Maybe now would be a good time to give a little bit of uh, introduction uh, sure. from you as like maybe two to three minutes high level of a little bit of your backstory and how you ended up in the welding and fabrication business. All right, cool. So let's start out. Uh, four score in 20 years. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, man, but you know, in the nineties, I grew up with tradesmen, man, like my father, electrician, my uncle, uh, welder, and he was, uh, my grandfather, brick mason, plumber, my other grandfather, he was an electrician. Um, my other uncle was a carpenter who else had cousins that were in the trade. So it was just kind of like a family affair. Plus we had real estate. So it was all of these trades came together. We flipped houses as a kid. So like, it was a lot of summers where I would basically, as a you know, people say, "Oh, I got an allowance." I was like, "Yeah, I got allowed to work <laughs> with the family business," and you know, uh, but yeah, man, like every summer it was kind of like this big thing where the cousins, the sons, everybody, like all the young men in my family, and if the young ladies if they wanted to, but they really didn't. I would, <laughs> you would get out there. So, you know, I was I was laying bricks, <laughs> like 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 ten eleven years old. I was. <laughs> You know, obviously with supervision, I would learn a lot about, you know, electrical work. I could, you know, wire up, you know, single phase, uh, (laughs) you name it. Right. And then I took to welding as a kid because, you know, I was really big into go-karts. I was really big into dune buggies. My grandfather, he, uh, he had a lot of land down in Kentucky. So it was just like in the summer, we would have like two weeks down there 
And the one thing that my uncle used to do was he used to every year he used to we used to build a go kart or doom buggy. And we would my grandfather would haul it down to Kentucky to his horse farm and we would like obviously tear it up every year. So it was it was kind of like our little thing, right? So um I did that pretty much most of my young life and then all the way up until college. Uh, when I started college, because because the men in my family had worked so hard, you know, in the trades and, you know, being honest, like my uncles, like most of my uncles had degrees. Uh, my grandfather did and they were both were um, military vets and, you know, Army and Navy. And they were like, you know, you don't need to break your back like this. You need to be smart because I used to do project management for a lot of our uh, rehabs. Like, you know, at 16, I was at home, like managing the finances of a particular rehab. I was managing crews at, you know, because I knew what was supposed to be what and went to college. Uh, but during college, I was still doing like trades work. Right. Like I funny enough, I had a union card <laughs> at the local uh, electrician union in uh, the town I went to college at and it was just like you know I was like well this is how I make some money and then I would come home in the summers and then um you know finish college still was you know milling around the trades at the end of it and I had a job at Fidelity Investments at the time too so I was like hustling all over the place but things kind of got rough around that time like the market it, it was like really starting to do its thing this is prior to the 2008 crash and I lost a job at Fidelity Investments, knew there was no no place for me after um, for college. There was nobody hiring any type of accounting or anything like that. So I was like, all right, let's do the military thing. And um, went to the military, did my time there, honorable discharge, and um, did a, con a year as a contractor. And um, I was in Balad, uh, came back, was like, all right can't do this forever because it was just it was just really crazy because it was worse it was a worse deployment than being in the military at least in the military you had kind of uh, a timeline when you'd be out of there and unless you got fired you really wasn't getting that same guarantee with the contractor side so came home you know was like all right let's let's do this corporate thing and as a and I tell people this all the time and they start laughing Somebody basically told me, because a friend of mine was in law school and they basically told me like, hey, you know, I don't think you can do it. And, you know, I, I, I get like Michael Jordan when people tell me you can do it. And I took that offensive. <laughs> so it was like do or die at that point. You know what I mean? So, you know, I was working um, at the time. I want to say like I was in law school working big three consulting. Uh, and doing <laughs> the most random thing ever, which is high end debt collection. I just it. It's not like the people that call you and say, well, you owe T-Mobile. No, this is a little bit different. Court orders, appraisers, you know, you name it. Um, yeah, I did that and, you know, finished up law school and was like, all right, let's try this corporate. Let's try corporate life, right? A year and some change. I was like, uh-uh, I can't do this. Like, it, it just, it put me... I don't know, man, it just kind of like took all of my energy. And then it was just trying to like find this, do this balancing act of wanting to be professional, but also wanting to <laughs> let your personality shine, right? So after that, I was just like, all right, my uncle and my dad was like, you know, you can always come home, manage, project manage our, you know, projects again. And I was just like, nah, I think I want to go full hands on, you know, like, I think I want to go full hands on. And, um, but that wasn't the initial like step, right? Like I did go home and start working with them, but then I got an opportunity to do some pipeline welding, like because I had like, you know, the skills to do it. Did a little few months contract with that, just realized like I didn't want to do that every day. It was kind of grueling. And, and then I went back home again. <laughs> and then the family was like, all right, so what, what are we doing here? You know, like you got this law degree you're not going to use clearly and you don't want to do the project management stuff. Like, what do you want to do? And fortunately, I had a supportive family because it, it just allowed me to kind of go in and do what I wanted to do. So I just started fabricating more. I was already good at it. I'm one of those people that I'm extremely precise and, you know, I'm very anal about things being exact. So, you know, it was just right up, right up the alley. And then from there, just kind of like it flourished into this 
to his own thing. Um, as a result, my uncle and I came up with a plan to create like other territories. So we hit down in Texas. Uh, we hit a few like large projects, pretty much all across the country, but we anchored down in Texas. And then, you know, it was just like, uh, my wife had an opportunity to come out to the East Coast uh, while we were down in Texas. It was like, why don't we just make that the next uh, territory? And I was like, hell yeah. So, you know, me being me, like I like to network with people and people seem to pretty much like me. I'm not, I'm, I'm easy to get along with, if that makes sense. And, you know, met a gentleman, he was older, really bad arthritis in his hand. And that's kind of like a death sentence for welders. And, you know, his business was like losing a lot of money. He had guys that really had no driving direction. And um, I know they'll probably hear this because I told them I was going to be doing this, but I don't want them to think that I'm talking bad about them. They just didn't have the leadership that they needed at the time due to his physical issues. And we made a deal <laughs> for me to buy him out. And it, and that's pretty much where my story on the East Coast started. And it was, it's been on since then. Then I opened up my own shop at the same time. <laughs> like I opened up a secondary like shop to kind of supplement what was going on in the other shop and built that up. It's been about 10 months now with that one. And we have been kicking ass ever since. And now I, uh, I got my own personal shop. So that's, that's coming along well, but that'll be more so like uh, um, more standardized, for like manufacturing small parts and stuff like that. Kind of my test zone for like the business model stuff I was telling you about earlier. But mm. that's about it, man. <laughs> you had uh, made a post that like one of your first gigs with your uncle was making a grill and said you made 26 grand off of your first job. And I was like, yeah, man. Oh, that's that's a sign to say green flags. Come on down. Like this mm -hmm. is uh, this is the business you ought to be in. Yeah. Like I didn't. So, man, honestly, because I hadn't really truly worked in it like like that as an adult, I didn't understand like the money part of it. Like when I was young even in college, like they paid me very well, like to come home and do work and stuff like that. But, you know, like when I was like in it, in it with him, I was like, holy shit, like what? That's how much you, like, bruh, I, I was just completely taken back because I was like, you know, even from a corporate standpoint, I just did not believe that, you know, you can make a single item and get thousands of dollars from it like that, like over $20,000, right? And I was just, just flabbergasted bro just completely flabbergasted but i was happy as hell because i was like oh so i'm not gonna be poor okay all right <laughs> i ain't living on the street anymore that's good right you know <laughs> like the whole nine yards man it's it's interesting to me that that was such a draw for you because it's not like you like you said you you went to law school you worked for some high-end consulting companies it's yeah. not like you were I mean, I, I don't know what you were making, but you weren't making pennies. I would, no, I would guess definitely. what what was so different about this? It was kind of like the freedom, man, like the freedom of being able to make decisions on a fly that weren't extremely regimented. Um, like I, I try to liken corporate America to uh, the, mil the military without the rank and file. So it, it's like, it's like unorganized, organized chaos. <laughs> and, but it's like mundane as hell, man. Like, like you mind numbing stuff, right? Like it, they, 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 people try to like romanticize like corporate America, like you, you willing and dealing and you're making, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that career growth and all that stuff. But I'm like, if you really look at like the day in the day out, that shit is boring. Like, boring like and don't get me wrong i've dealt with some high level stuff because of my security clearance and whatnot so i was able to do on the gov side which was some pretty cool shit however it was still like mind numbing it's like okay this is just just too much like i mean it wasn't enough mentally stimulation for, mental stimulation for me and i like being outside too man like that's one thing i miss about the military i was an eod so i was always outside so you know yeah you had made a post talking about a lot of other eod guys coming back to trade work what do you think mm -hmm. that military people i just over the last year i've spoken to so many 
former military folks like all going into ETA to buying businesses or like starting companies in this mm. small and medium business service space uh, specifically. What's so attractive about that? Is it the autonomy or like, it's like certainly at least right away, it's definitely not for the money. And like, you're kind of inviting a bunch of stress on to kind of like operate a business and maybe the, the money is going to come, mm. but, but it certainly is like a, it seems to be a very long-term thinking move because you're kind of like, obviously operating a business is not easy. Right. So like in regards to that particular tweet, like I have a, like a lot of guys that, you know, I started with that either became electricians or um, I got some more guys who are, what do they do? Um, Electricians. I got one guy. He actually does demolition work um, like for pipelines, for the oil and gas companies. All of these guys, like the, the one thing that we all have in common was it's a thing called stress inocul- inoculation, right? Like the military teaches you how to hurry up and wait. And as a byproduct, in my mind, at least, we have learned patience in the most extreme form, right? Like and especially like you know, the a lot of the guys like you know it was hurry up and wait but it was a lot of things that was serious on the line that you had to be prepared for at all times so you had to keep your mind sharp i think entrepreneur like being an entrepreneur and starting these type of businesses like service based smbs specifically it allows you to problem solve kind of on the go and a lot of these guys are very very good at that in the service and it just kind of like translate that skill outside of that and again, just being um, challenged in such a way that you don't get bored, but you also are used to the grueling days of, you know, what the military put you through, right? And not, not necessarily that's saying that's a bad thing, but it gives you really a lot of tough skin that you can weather those storms. Now, the other part of it is that you don't have the financial security as you did in the military. So that adds another complex layer on that. But what you know i've noticed like for me i was lucky because i had a family that you know if i was if i you know going through this journey if anything had went wrong i know i could have picked up the phone and been literally okay same day but some of my friends don't have that luxury right and you know i can't say for them but i know for me like it was just the freedom and then also just being able to handle the ups and downs of that now buying this shop and opening that shop is definitely like, you know, put some hair on the nuts, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, giving me a new level of patience. Plus my daughter, she's four years old and that's a whole nother challenge in itself. Yeah. I uh, want to get into that, uh, like opening that and kind of like maybe going through the process of buying that first shop or whatever, some of the okay. challenges that you saw there. Uh, one more question about just kind of military guys or sure. and gals operating in that space. Do you find yourself encouraged by the ability to like not limited by the ability to personally like grow and develop? I think that something I find myself hearing a lot from people that are in this space is they're not capped in terms of like, you're not limited by making more money of just like waiting to make rank or like mm-hmm. to go on to move to the next thing. Like your life and business can move as fast as you can handle. And oh, yeah. so, something that's a little bit dangerous, like you can definitely get out over your skis, but it having the ability to move as quickly as you want to is certainly attractive. Oh, for sure, man. Like I think like once I kind of, me and my uncle kind of got around and he, you know, cause one thing is I had to learn that the transition from being like the kid to the adult and then being the, the, the adult to the business partner is that you want to, you learn about the money part, right? Like you learn mm-hmm. the true money part. And <clears throat> like I've been in the military and, and everything else. It was just like, Oh, I could, Oh, so if I, you know, if if I take on this project with this amount of guys, then I can make this at the end of it. Or I can, you know, guarantee that, you know, I have a salary of X at the end of it. Like, and all I got to do is show up and do good work and have, oh, say less. 
it was a it was a wrap. Like it was yeah. like to the, to the moon at that point. I wasn't. It was no fear at that point. Like that first check on my own, I was like, it's game time. So I just you know I took that and was just like, well, there's a reason to get up every day. <laughs> yeah, no, big time. That's uh, it's, it's not uh, it makes that BAH that first BAH check you got at one point uh, seem a little bit small. At one point, that right. was the biggest thing that ever right. made it <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> facts. Let's uh, I, I want to hear about this the the first like you taking over and like agreeing to buy that guy out, and then yep. can you maybe give us um like a sense for the scale of the business at that time um any like numbers that you can share is like always good and then maybe kind of uh bring us up to speed on like where you are now and and some of those challenges along the way okay um so the size of the shop is about six thousand square foot it's pretty big at one point they were on track to be the largest kind of structural uh engineering player like metal um player out in this area at the time well let me be very specific because this was like closer to the um i want to say closer to well it's a little bit further north of um the dc area so it's like around gavisburg uh maryland so they were doing a lot of work between dc and baltimore and at one point before the current owners arthritis got bad and i'm talking about like five years ago they were doing about maybe two and a half, three million in revenue with about a 20% profit margin. So not really bad, like at all. Like he was making a pretty decent living. Um, he, he, he prioritized at the time, slow and steady growth. So he was kind of like me. I don't really like looking at, I don't like the idea of using debt to really raise my, um, to scale like that. It's, it's not that I'll, think that that has its place i just know for me like i like to be in control of the steps up and you can do that you know with cash flow and obviously saving and making sure that you're prepared for that now he had about four or five different guys on uh he had two fabricators and two installers and they kind of subbed out based on what was going on during the time and yeah so they were doing um like five years ago they were doing that and then as his arthritis got bad, it started to decline because he couldn't, you know, assist in getting everything done. And, you know, I love the guys to death, but, you know, at the time, like they were kind of like a pack of wolves without the leader, you know what I mean? So they were kind of, they didn't really have the drive to like, okay, we're going to take on these projects and make sure that they go correctly. We're going to, you know, do this. Nobody's really taking any initiative and, and I can understand why, because the owner at the time really paid it close to the chest. So he dealt with all the meetings, he got all the business and no, had nobody like, like, uh, <coughs> excuse me, shadowing him. So when I came out here, you know, I was honestly just looking for a place because I was welding out of my garage, right? So I was looking for a place uh, more so to work out of. And he, you know, me and him got to talking, met at the metal store. We got to talking. He was just like, you know, if you want to come by the shop and, you know, do some work, he was like, feel free. He was like, I won't even charge you anything because he's a he was a Marine vet. Cool guy. So he was just like, you know, I got you, brother. So I did my first project there. <laughs> right. Like it was a nice little railing, glass inserts. Cool. So I'm working there doing, I did the entire project by myself. So his team was kind of just kind of in awe, like, damn, like (laughs) you're a one man wrecking crew. I'm like, yeah, I get shit done. And, you know, just being around there, like he started showing me things and I started realizing like the guys were getting a little antsy because they started to notice that he was missing um, checks, you know, like he had a couple of bounce checks with him. And, you know, he was trying to do his best, but, you know, pride kind of took over. He really wanted to make it work and just had the idea. I was just like, man, I wonder if he'd let me buy this because I'm like, man, it's a nice size shop, you know, some real estate attached to it. And I'm like, it's a nice size shop. I can do a lot in here and I'm pretty sure I can get these guys on board and like let's like let's see what i can do so being completely honest i had no idea what the hell i was doing okay like i wasn't like sophisticated 
in terms of like how to like purchase a business. Like I knew it existed. You know, I'd done some research. I even called some old buddies from the consulting side that, that worked in uh, mergers and acquisition, like LBO style, right? I like, I called them, asked them like, hey, like, what should I do? And a lot of them were just kind of like, well, you know, they want to tell you this multiple, that multiple. And I'm like, man, I don't know. Like, it, that's a lot to kind of come in with considering the circumstances. So, you know, a few months passed and he's just like, I tell you what, man. He's like, <laughs> he was like, if you can buy me out, I think the number at the time he originally wanted was like seven hundred some thousand dollars. But they were at this point like sub like one million in revenue. Right. Like, you know, like they were low, like. I mean, barely covering uh, expenses and stuff. And I was just like, I don't know about that one. But I, I just kind of thought the idea came to me. I was just like, well, I could have given that price, but he'd have to sell the finance, the whole thing. You know, because I have friends in real estate. My dad was in, my, my parents were in real estate. My uncle was in real estate. He was just like, why don't you just get a seller finance? And at that point, I was like, well, I can get him closer to what he wants, 700000 But I'm like, man, it's going to kind of suck in terms of, you know, trying to build this up because I wasn't truly prepared to own a shop at the time. I was really more prepared for just like a two, maybe a two, three man operation in a small shop. Right. We, we, we shook hands on the, with the, with the understanding that we keep his guys on board and I keep them working because a lot of those guys have been with him like 20 years, some of them a little shorter than that, but you know, they had basically based feeding their family off of his word. And, you know, they were really going to stick with him regardless if the ship went down or not, which is, you know, admirable. But, you know, for me, I was like, are you crazy? And, you know, I understood like where they were and we made an agreement, shook hands on it. I gave him, I think, $200,000 in cash. Uh, and I just told him just to go introduce me to everybody. <laughs> you know, like we spent like about the first two, three months me we going we, we were going everywhere because he did some jobs out in philly he did some jobs in baltimore he did some jobs in pennsylvania i mean he was all over the place and you know i was like man that's part of the problem right now you got your guys being spread out so thin and you know you can't do everything you used to do so i started like kind of formulating the idea of like what i needed to do which was localize the business a lot more before we started to look to branch out again. And that's what I did like as soon as I took over. So like I went heavy, like the metal supplier, I was just like, look, man, I'm, I'm gonna buy this X amount of stock. Um, do you got any clients that, you know, like they come in asking or you know anybody personally? Like I was just networking with everybody like at that point. Um, we started doing structural jobs, a lot of structural jobs immediately. Uh, because, you know, I had a monthly payment due to him. I think it was, it was around 12 grand a month. You know, that was what we came up with, like 200, 200 down, 12 a month, because I was like, I know I can make that and give that to him. But what I wasn't thinking about was like the running the business. So like, I was like cash strapped initially, like, because it took a lot of upfront cash now. Don't get it twisted. I had a lot of savings that I could dip into, but, you know, in terms of like life being comfortable for those first few months, it was not because, you know, being headstrong, sometimes you run into situations like this thinking that, oh, it's, it's going to be simple, but <laughs> it wasn't, you know. Were, yeah, you, uh, were you paying yourself during that time when you were no. making those payments? Oh, okay. Nope. Just, nope. just living off the savings and paying him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause on the side of it, like just, for full transparency like i i still do uh some consulting on the side like so like being honest i still don't take a check right now we're talking about over a year and some change later um i still don't take a salary now because my consulting money like from stuff that i was doing in corporate still is enough to pay my bills but you know when you start dipping into that <laughs> you start like Oof. so yeah man but yeah i was i was fine but it was just like, I I jumped into it because I just was like, oh, this could work, this could work. But I didn't really come in with a plan of attack at first. I was just kind of like, I'm gonna get in there, do like my uncle does, and then boom, I got it. But it hit me in the chest, man. What do you think that were the most critical things that you should have done? Uh, like, let's say that you're gonna go back and do this acquisition a second time. 
same circumstances with the knowledge that you've got now, what moves would you have done differently? Just maybe speaking to other people looking to buy businesses or in a similar spot. So one thing I would have done is because we had a big problem with the machinery, right? Like uh, the machinery was really old and it worked, but you know, the kind of the phrase people say that don't broke, if it's not broke, don't fix it. That's complete bullshit because even if it's not broke, it can be inefficient. You know what I mean? For the operation that you need to have. And, and I knew better at the honesty, I really did know better, but you know, it was an ego thing that kind of drove me into that. But looking back now, it would have definitely the equipment would have been the first thing I checked out, you know, um, because like, and, 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 and God bless my team because they, they were doing their best. But I found a lot of things to be out of spec because of the equipment being aged as it was. And, you know, I think I said it earlier in here, I'm very anal about things being exact especially when we come down to manufacturing. Like, I don't play that. Like, so- You got specs to make and, you know, there's buildings being built on this stuff. Like, bro, I keep a micrometer <laughs> with me to make sure. Measure that. Like, I don't play. But yeah, like, you know, bless their hearts. They're good guys, solid guys. They just needed a little bit better guidance. Um, we were having problems with the final product coming out the door, skewed and things like that. And I was just like, okay, like they don't really have pride in what they're doing right now. And I think it was just a, like a, a lack of, uh, you know, just motivation. And I don't think they, because right now they're, they're humming like a well oiled machine. I just think that they needed like somebody who cared enough to be like, now nah, we're going to do it this way. But yeah, like equipment would be one. Also, understanding the temperament of the crew that you're getting like really understanding the crew because like for me like when i came in there i was like hot shot like <laughs> we're gonna ch -ch -ch -ch, we're gonna do this 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 and this and you know like i don't want to hear nothing this is what we're doing but a lot of those guys have their own working tempo they have their own working you know their harmonic balance as i like to call it and you can't go disturbing that when you're a new face you can't go disturbing that especially you know, when you, when you take the helm as the owner, because they'll go back and say, well, I used to do X, Y, and Z with him. Like, how oh, well, I can't do that with you. And it's like, I am not him though. Like, you know, and that causes a lot of conflict. And that, that kind of like attributed to a few months where things were just not like really good. Like, and then on top of that cash flow, understanding that when you make that deal, you need to account for working capital need to account for, you know, making sure that all the systems are, you know, good to go in terms of how you manage your capital and, and how you use that capital. Uh, oh, the accounting. Oh, my God. I bet those books were a mess. <laughs> a mess is an understatement. <laughs> a mess is an understatement. Like, I had to call a buddy of mine from Deloitte and I was like, bruh, he's the CPA. I said, honestly, man, I know this is going to probably cost me an arm and leg and probably my second born child or whatever the case may be. But I need you. I need you. And man, he came down and like I'm talking about paper records from like 25 years. Paper records, man. So, Ouch. yeah. So those are things that I would do differently. Um but fortunately for me, I'm never one of those people that look at the situation and be like, oh, I screwed myself and get have a pity party because it just fired me up even more. I was like, all right, fuck it. It's time to get live. <laughs> Let's go. Like, you know, on the fly. It's like, who can I call? You know, who can I call to fix this situation? Who can I um, who can I tap to help me with this? You know, and then just networking, too, because that was a, you know, at first it wasn't it wasn't easy to network because the guy had had, you know, this 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 kind of reputation because his quality has started falling so the being associated with it at this point as the new owner it was like oh same story different face <laughs> you know what I mean so yeah just understanding like um doing some reputation management uh prior to yeah it sounds like if you're uh calling in buddies from Deloitte you were really going after the big guns on <laughs> Yeah, no, I just needed I needed that help to clean that up, man. Cause those books was just terrible, man. Like, bruh. 
that was like a half a bottle of whiskey and la that that last call when the lights are still dim and you like all right let's go home with it <laughs> like, <laughs> well and i think that that uh, a lot of the things that you talked about there it's like fringy all the the smb folks you know kind of know exactly that feeling and if they've mm -hmm. made an acquisition before have largely dealt with a lot of those issues it mm -hmm. highlights a big opportunity because a lot of those a lot of the this smbs that are in existence right now are run that way and right. so for somebody that's talented and can like kind of grit through that there you've got a big chance to drastically improve it mm -hmm. um my question i guess would be what are the things maybe that are and I don't, maybe you didn't know and maybe just got lucky or maybe you saw it and it was no big deal, but anything that could have been like a deal breaker um, in terms of like, you know, you're talking about managing your cash flow and your accounting. If the books are that big of a mess, you could maybe take over the business and be up shit creek really, really quick and maybe make a big mistake. Um, are there areas maybe that warrant really specific attention? um when looking at those so that's actually funny that you say that because i don't know like, i'm pretty sure you probably saw it but i'm i'm like at this point starting a due diligence uh company where i deal i i dive into the operation side of the company like you know supply chain management equipment <laughs> manpower training safety and quality assurance like i started a company i'm starting well it's almost finished being formed but I'm starting that because those were the areas where like I had to come in and like literally like literally like focus my my attention so much so that like it took away from other things and 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 just to kind of like just to kind of like dog myself out I knew better like I really did know better because my father has a he has an electrician business and he has like 15 guys and my uncle the welding business he has like you know 11 12 guys uh, at this point. So I knew what to look for. And again, I just kind of jumped in like a dummy and just kind of was like, you know, when you want your own thing, especially when you come in from, you know, filling shoes and stuff like that, like on a familiar, like a family side, you, you just, you get tunnel vision, but yeah, like, so the consulting, the consulting business, like on the operation and stuff, like the equipment, uh, like I said, quality assurance, uh, supply chain, like those are things because we had a huge problem with uh, like the suppliers that we were working with because we had, you know, at, originally we were doing, uh, before I opened the second shop, <clears throat> we were doing more structural stuff. And man, he didn't realize that he was overpaying by like 40% because he'd been with these guys for years and they didn't think to, I mean, maybe they just thought he was just it was sweet like that but he never thought to challenge the pricing he just said this was the price that they gave me so i paid and i was just like man i'm like looking at that i was like oh hell no <laughs> i'm like bruh i can go up the street and find that at maybe a five percent markup which is not bad but you know 40 percent, bruh like so yeah those are the things that I would definitely hone in on because, um, you know, I'm not the most savviest financial guy, but I have people that, that are. So I don't really, you know, I know I can get them and um, get them and, um, you know, uh, to help me out if I need it. Yeah. Well, you don't got to be a, a savvy financial guy to know when you're being ripped off, when you can buy the same product for, for sure. <laughs> that much cheaper in another spot. For sure. You've alluded to, you said you're talking about this acquisition and it kind of talked about running multiple shops. You've mm -hmm. talked about um, like running these remotely and you've got shops in different locations. How do you manage that, especially so early on? This is another like hot topic for SMB folks of like when to expand, uh, you know, not growing too quickly because you're kind of, as you've all alluded to also with all of the problems of just this one business taking on that multiple and multiple times and too quick of succession is mm -hmm. another recipe for disaster. So how are you managing that? So remember I was telling you how as a kid, the family would get all the boys together. So wh wherever we are, wherever we have like kind of territory is usually where somebody lives. 
<laughs> okay so it's someone in the family that's that's doing something that's managing that particular location but i'm usually overseer of all of that because i have like instead of just like a specific skill i'm not generalized either i'm highly specialized but and enough things that i can run that you know run it as i see fit because we know how to communicate with each other but yeah so you know i wouldn't i wouldn't I, I wouldn't say that I have some sort of magic or anything like that. It's just just the fact that our family's been in this for a while, so we have, you know, the the, the infrastructure, if you will. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, are you are you guys doing multiple trades out of the same shop? Is that? Uh, no, actually. Oh, okay. Um, so they're separate. Uh, but now actually we're looking to my dad and uncle are looking to merge um into one we're so the plan right now is to put everything under one umbrella um bring everything in house because right now it's just a bunch of different um bunch of different llc's under a holding company you know so we want to just one band one sound this thing like that's the next step Mm-hmm. But trying to figure out the legalities of it, trying to figure out the intellectual property side of it, trying to figure out the licensing side of it, it's just been kind of really complex. And, you know, like we we got some good folks. Like I'm not the, uh, I wasn't the only person in my family who went to law school. So we have family that's working on that as well. But I'm going to be honest with you, they move very, very slow. So <laughs> what uh, what kind of benefits do you see from bringing that all under one umbrella? So for us, it would allow us to, uh, in terms of marketing specifically, it would allow us to, you know, like, like lessen the amount that we spend uh, because we wouldn't be spending it, you know, to branch out each different uh, like brand that's currently under it. It would just give us a little bit more synergy in terms of like how we manage things in house. Um, I think that would be like the benefit primarily, but then also larger facility that could, you know, from a real estate side, we have a facility, half of the facility could be for, you know, welding, fabrication, the other half could be, you know, because electrical stuff, you don't really need like a shop shop for because you're doing more stuff on site than anything, but it would allow like my father to be able to do more storage and stuff like that because that was kind of like a big thing for a while. Like he, like the stuff that he needed a lot he was trying to carry it in a, uh, basically a sprinter. And it just was, it was causing a lot of issue because break-ins and stuff like that was happening quite a bit. One of the other interesting things that you had posted about that I wanted to kind of ask and get you to kind of lay out because I think it would be beneficial. You talked about using uh, like technical or trade schools as recruiting locations. Mm-hmm. You know, like walk through like how that kind of came to be and how that had maybe changed or impacted your recruiting for new fabricators. Oh man, let's, let's, let's go down that path. Let's get it. (laughs) So when, um, when I purchased the first shop, right, it was, it was one, I needed, I needed fresh blood that could help because you know, most of the guys in the first shop, they're like, we're all closer to 40. Some of them are over 40. So, you know, kind of stuck in our ways type, right? And it's hard to truly, truly like, you know, because I'd say we're younger, uh, like tradesmen. Think about it like a mentor-mentee relationship. People are a lot more like malleable in terms of what they're willing to learn from this person as well as, you know, what they're willing to uh, teach, right? So, man, it was like... I started like before, like I, before I got the second shop, before I started the second shop, it was like, all right, I need young blood. And I was like, I noticed that the residential side of things, like the first shop couldn't cover because they were more structural based guys. So I was like, you know, the residential projects, like the staircases, the nice staircases, the nice railings, you know, the uh, sculptures and things like that, because we've done some sculptures as well. And I was just like, man, I got to get some new blood who got like some new eyes on that stuff because, you know, where I had basically been the youngest um, in the family welding business. Like, so I was the one that everybody took, you know, advice from and stuff like that because I had so many a plethora of experiences. Like I needed that. So, you know, I was like, man, I could see this market opening. 
you know, with the residential side, I was like, but I really don't, it's virtually impossible to really find like welders that are willing to come work for you if they're already out there, unless they have come from another shop. And I'll tell you a little, I'll tell you what I did <laughs> to get other welders from the shop right after this. But uh, I was at the metal shop and, you know, I was just like, man, I put some, some, some fillers out on Craigslist, LinkedIn and all that stuff. And Nobody was biting. And I was like, even with the like the benefits that we were offering, like nobody was biting, like or the pay. Like, I mean, we were offering uh way over the the normal for out here. Like, like, and it's pretty high because uh DC area got a high cost of living. So we couldn't interact with that. I was like, dang. At the metal shop again. I always meet people at the metal shop because that's where a lot of people like hang out. So the uh guy that I buy metal from was like, did you ever think about going to the trade school? I was like, huh, that's a good ass idea. All right, let me see if this will work, you know, and just started calling because it was just like it made more sense to, you know, get in touch with these folks because I was like, man, they, they still got like this fresh blood, like people who are just into it. So they're going to be, you know, willing to go buy the book. I'm going to more than likely they're just going to be happy to, to get on board with something because it was kind of tough for people finding jobs in that space at the time probably the best decision I've ever, ever made because I got some super talent, bro. Like, super talent. Like, like these 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 kids from fucking rock stars. Like, like, I mean, dude, like, I don't, I, people, they say they're worried about the future. I'm like, y'all not paying attention. Like, yes, yeah, it's, it's going to be some bleak moments, but there's some kids out here who, who, who got, who got it, who got that it back. Uh, but I found like some really good fabricators. Uh, still had to, you know, teach a lot of them about the installation side of it and how we make things precise, how we, you know, how you read plans, blueprints, and stuff like that. But you know, those are little things that you learn as you go. You don't need to know it. But in terms of them putting metal to uh, putting flame to metal, they got it. And um, but yeah, man, it was like uh, I, I made a deal with a school, and basically we set it up to where while they're still in school they get OJT by coming to work for me. And, you know, I pay them, uh, I have to pay, I think I pay, pay uh, the students still 15 an hour who are like still in school. But when, when I bring them on, they come in at 25 an hour. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but yeah, man, trade school, tech school, bro. A1, man, like A1, but you know, like a, anything, sit around, and, and see who you're getting before you just say, "Oh, I got a, I got a, I got a funnel now," you know. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but I said I was gonna tell you how I I was getting tradesmen from other shops. So I learned a lot about ass through a good friend of mine, and I was just like, "All right," and he was teaching me about geotagging, like locations, like for people to specifically get your ads. So what I did was. The competitors that, and I, we don't have no problem or nothing like that, but I was just like, man, I need people and, you know, we don't really have relationships, so I don't feel bad about this. I would geotag their shops. So my ad delivery for jobs <laughs> would go to their techs because they would be geotagged in their location. So all of a sudden they start getting ads <laughs> from my company. Oh man. So they're like on their phone or whatever at the job shop. and they're getting ads. Oh man. That's ruthless. <laughs> I, 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 know, I man. did that. I know, but it worked. I got, I got some seasoned guys to help my young guys. So, mm -hmm. you know, but that's why I tell people like, if you don't get on this tech stuff now, you're going to find out real quick. Cause that's, you know, mind you, that's a little bit of a thing that you can do. Right. Imagine what, well, that other stuff that I don't even know yet. <laughs> Yeah. What, what kind of things do you find yourself competing over to attract those people other than just money? Like the more seasoned people I'm talking about. It's the type of work and the type of environment, you know, like it's kind of weird because a lot of these guys, they are the, some, some of these guys, they, they don't want a highly politicized environment. They don't want to talk about politics. They just want to make metal beautiful. Right. And so I tell I have a policy. We don't talk about politics in here, you know, like like if you want to engage in something productive, sure. But we don't talk about nothing that's going to upset the balance in here because I like I tell them straight up, 
I care about your well-being, but I don't care about your political positions. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't, because I don't even have one. I'm just, I'm agnostic about everything. So, you know, that was like the biggest thing because I had one guy tell me in the interview, he was like, you're not one of the, you know, because just obviously I'm a black man. So he was like, he's like, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? I said, I don't have an opinion on something that I'm not involved in. <laughs> he was just like, oh, okay, okay, cool, 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 cool. He's like, I'm just trying to make sure you're not woke. I was like, one, you're using woke wrong, but two, you know, I was like, <laughs> you know, there are no identity politics over here. If you can do the job, then that's what I'm here. That's what we're here for. So, mm -hmm. you know, they like that I'm straightforward about that type of stuff that, you know, there is, I don't, I don't have an agenda. I don't want them to have an agenda. I want them to come do what it is they're, they're there to do. And you can, as soon as you're off the clock, you can do the hell you want, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I do foster an environment that everybody, you know, should understand that we're there to get better. Um, you know, I don't know about making you a better person, but I definitely know about making you a better tradesman, you know? And that's how I keep things on the even keel, especially for bringing people in from other shops because, you know, being very honest with you, you either, you know, a lot of the welding operations, especially in this area, it's usually mostly white men. So, and just to add, add like a component to this, I took over a shop that was literally 100% white men. But, you know, my veteran background, as well as me knowing what the hell I'm doing, like it, 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 that knocked that right on out the park. Nobody was even thinking about it. They was like, we can't talk shit to this guy because, like, we just watched him literally build like 100 feet of railing and in place glass by himself. What are we going to say to him that's going to impact his, you know what I mean, anything that he got going on? And, you know, hey, it worked out in my favor. One of the things I find really interesting about trade work is, is it's so similar to, or the environments are so similar to the military because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you can talk all the shit you want. It's about the quality of your work, or yeah. maybe it's your, your PFT score or whatever. Like you, if you can back it up, then, you know, you're going to get the respect that you deserve. And oh, so yeah. uh, that's super cool. Oh yeah, man. It's like, it, it cuts a lot of shit down when it's like, are you good at what you do? Yes. All right, cool. Respect. Let's keep going. Mm -hmm. I think you highlighted another thing there too, that by bringing in people who are in the trade or technical school to your shop for OJT, mm -hmm. you're able to kind of like try them out as a cultural fit for your shop. Yes. And then also kind of give back to the whole trade system you get some some discounted labor get to mm -hmm. kind of like help train and bring up them up and also yep. kind of give back to the the ecosystem of that environment yeah for sure man like um and here's the thing so while i do pay the ones who are just getting ojt 15 an hour i give them commissions on every job too so they could get the 25 dollars an hour just because like when you're in school, I know you got to focus, man, because I've been there myself. So, like, I, I take care of them on the back end, but I, the school will only allow them to make 15 an hour. So, mm, okay. so, yeah, man, like, it does. So, the, OJ, the OJT side of it, honestly, man, it just really gives you really good insight on what's going to happen with labor uh, in the interim and in the long term, right? Uh, but for me, it's more fulfilling because, like, having, like, family in the business, like, it's really dope because, like, they taught me everything. And obviously, there was no, it was just, hey, you're my son, you're my nephew, your grandson, we're going to teach you everything just because you need to know this for life, right? But, like, you know, on my side, it's more like, man, like, I've been fortunate enough to learn these skills for free. Uh, like, let me at least give somebody a shot, too, because, you know, um, while prior to this we weren't able to hire people who didn't have the skills already now we're in a we're we got enough motion and enough, enough cash flow and enough work that we can start bringing in people who don't know how to weld at all and you know we have some people like that actually like just starting out and we're able to like teach them and bring them in which will you know because sometimes these trade schools aren't cheap and you know depending on what happened in your life because we have some guys that got felonies, so they can't get financial aid for this type of stuff. So we have to bring them in. We have to teach them everything. And it's just really fulfilling because it's like, man, you're giving somebody an opportunity so they'll never have to, 
you know, beg anybody for a job because <laughs> they got the skills to do, you know, what others can't. And that makes me happy. Like, <laughs> even though I've had every opportunity in life, you know, not really any shortfalls with people being able to stop anything I've ever wanted to do. I just, I know from just seeing how people who had those restrictions via B, you know, from from mistakes they made as a as a as a early young adult, or just even just life being life, you know, just being able to provide that opportunity. It's like, man, like I can sleep good at night. And then also too, man, people are really grateful um, when you take care of them. Like, you know, I was in, I've been out of town pretty much all week, so you know, being gone, I was like really paranoid because that was like the first time I really like left left. So it was just like okay, is everything, anything going to go wrong? And I was trying not to check my phone, trying not to call, which I didn't, but to find out that things did go wrong, but they were just corrected and I didn't even have to get involved with it. And, you know, these are from newer folks. These are from my older guy. It was just perfect, man. I was like, oh, building the right team, building the right environment, and they will, they will flourish. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's like such a vote of confidence that you're kind of doing the right thing and putting it to the test for the first time. Facts. Facts, man. Love it though, man. I don't know. It's, it's, it's just cool. Cause it's like, you, I don't know, man. Like, cause you get, it's a lot of doom and gloom in this world right now. And it's like, the, the most basic the most basic things like for me just really make me happy and you know this it might seem like it's a lot like oh you're training people to you know weld and you're training people to fabricate training people you know to basically run many businesses in their own day to day with these projects and stuff like that but I don't know man it's just <laughs> it's like the sunshine man I don't know like even when it's raining the sun is shining to me <laughs> It's uh, I feel like a good sign that you're in the right line of work. Oh yeah, for sure too, man. I love every day. Like I get up every day happy as a goddamn pig and shit, bro. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that people most misunderstand about business ownership? I think the over oversimplification of what it takes to make a business work and the pitfalls that come along with it, be it be family be it be you know business related personnel related i think the oversimplification simplification of it like you know my gripe right now with like the smb community on twitter is that it's just like okay okay people who've never worked with their hands a day in their fucking lives you're gonna go out there you're gonna take some money and you're gonna make this thing work and it's like okay i understand that that's a marketing tool i understand that but it's like, these are real things. These are real services. These are things that people have trained their entire lives to do. Some of these things, at least. Um, these are things that people have spent time, money to build out. And, you know, it's, like, it's not as simple as you just jump in there and you just do something, right? Like there are steps you need to take. Like, you know, my like I told you about the mistakes that I made when I bought mine. You know, like I didn't, <laughs> and, 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 and that's just, you know, it worked out for me, but I would not recommend anybody to jump in it like that because that was stupid. It was it was a really unnecessary risk that had I been a lot more patient, I could have probably done a lot better uh, with the execution of it. We would have been where we are now, probably a little bit sooner. And so, yeah, the oversimplification of it. And then also everybody's rushing, rushing to like, OK, I'm going to. I'm going to roll up these companies and I'm going to roll up this and I'm roll up that. A lot of these folks are not taking into account that you have to deal with individuals. These, this is not corporate America. Like I like, okay, I'm not going to, I can't say who, but it's somebody on Twitter that I talk to very often. And uh, he was, he was saying that a surgery got punched in the face uh, when they were at, they showed up on site to a uh, plumber's business. And like basically hounding this guy, like, you know, I could do this for you, do that for you. And the guy just like lost it. Cause he's like, I don't want to hear from you because I'm not, he's like, I'm not, I don't have an MBA. I don't have a degree. I'm just a guy who became a plumber through, you know, through trade school and the union and stuff like that. Like leave me alone. And I was like, man, I was like, 
I want people to be a little bit more compassionate with these things as well, right? Like stop oversimplifying it. Stop trying to make, um, you know, this process of purchasing these businesses that people put blood, sweat, and tears to, like it's just a notch on a corporate belt because, you know, me personally, I'm like, I'm getting wind. A lot of these guys, like especially on my side of like the fence, for fab- fabrication, they're like, if you come in there and you ain't never did a day in your life doing with this trade, I will not, they're not even willing to talk to you because it's like an insult to them. Like, you just gonna come in and tell me that you can make this business better. You ain't never worked in it. Like, what? You know? And that, that kind of gives me an advantage, honestly, because I have worked in it and I have like a work history in it. And it don't matter like that I went to law school. It doesn't matter that, you know, I was in the military. It doesn't matter none of that stuff because when it, when it come down to brass tacks, like, oh yeah, I know, I know what this rod is. I know what this type of metal is. I know how to weld this particular metal. Yes, I can stack dimes, you know, all of that stuff, right? But I want people to be more compassionate, stop oversimplifying it. Um, and you know, and, and don't complicate it, but don't sim- don't oversimplify it. Take some time to really do your research. And, and instead of being fake and going out there and saying, hey, you know, I can get you this multiple and stuff like that. Honestly, a lot of these folks just want somebody to take an interest in what it is that they do. Like that's the that's the kind of the key that I learned. A lot of these folks just want somebody who's gonna who can buy that business, but they have an interest in what it is that they do because they they love that field, right? Like they're into it. Like I meet a lot of plumbers specifically, and I don't have the I don't have any type of want to buy a plumbing business or electrical business, even though my dad has given me one when he retires, but I don't have any, like, I don't want any of that type of stuff. I like what I do, but every person that I've met, they just want somebody that has a love, not even a love for it, just like, yo, man, this is like really interesting to me. Like, yo, I, I like X, Y, and Z, like willing to work with them, willing to come out in the field and show them that they just not a suit <laughs> that's going to take it and, and reorganize something that they spent you know, 25, 30 years building, you know, that's, that's, that's what I would say. And definitely, man, like, get help, like, get help, like, seriously, like, get help. I I, I messed up there. Uh, I messed up there really bad, like, with this first shot. But, you know, I had a happy ending just because I had a happy ending doesn't mean that, that it couldn't have been better, less stressful, you know, like, out for anybody listening to this, don't make the same mistake I did. <laughs> you know, just just take your time. It all things will come to you in due time if you just keep walking forward. That's fantastic advice. I think that it is difficult to kind of sort through the noise and the uh the influencers of people on <laughs> Twitter that are doing a lot of the things that you're talking about. Um yeah. highlighted well, their-, their hearts, man. Bless their heart. I don't think they mean any. I don't think they mean any malice or anything like that. I think, I think a lot of it, you know, and and I think, I think a lot of it just comes down to, you know, it's exciting and it's new. So it's like, and and let me not say exciting and new. It's it's just different, a different side of what's the normal trajectory for somebody who went to the wardens of the world, the Harvards of the world. It's different because it's like holy crap, the very thing that you guys told me to stay away from, that's why I went to school, is something that I could really, like, make money off of? Like, these people have been living like this without having to go through all of this, without the stress of going to get a degree, without the, like, it's it's a kind of an eye-opener. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't take it as any type of negativity that they're doing this, or that they're trying to, like, give the false perception that it's something that it's not. I just think it's just, uh, like, when a, when a puppy, you know, when a puppy is like overstimulated, they just running around doing all type of crazy stuff. And you're like, what? Well, calm down. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah, I love you still, buddy, but you need to calm down, relax. Your heart's beating out your chest. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's that. And I don't think it's, um, you know, I don't think it's any mouths or anything like that. I just think they're really excited because for the first time and really, and, and as far as I can remember, you know, people are being enticed back to the trades. Like, I remember a time when, you know, people were basically saying like, oh, if you go in, if you're going into the trades, you're you're uh, uh, you failed in life. You, that's the only thing you could do. Like I specifically remember people saying that like when when I was in college, I mean, I saw like, you know, I had a professor. I remember 
that he like was cursing this guy out who was uh you know i think he was a plumber or something like that cursing him out like this is the only thing you're good at da, da, da. and you know it threw me off because i grew up around trades and i'm like man my granddad had money bruh like what you like he got a horse farm bruh like what you mean <laughs> he's like, on that horse money <laughs> like, like i know he making more than you like what, why you okay you know but it, it you know i just think it's excitement man i just want people to to just be cognizant of it that's all that's all that's all i think they they're well-meaning people i think they really could do some good if they if they really just treat people a little bit more than just the numbers that their business is worth that's all i agree well and uh you know EOD man is just like all you got to do is cut the green wire. It's just that simple, right? Shit, you know, SMB, yeah. it's the same thing. Raise prices twenty percent and you're done. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, wipe your hand. All right, we're good here. You know, slow motion walk away. Let it blow up behind you. No back. What? No. No. Uh. No aftershock. No nothing. <laughs> right. Josh, this has been a uh, a really fun conversation. I appreciate oh, you joining man. me. What uh, what can myself or anybody listening do to be useful to you? Honestly, I I would like to be useful to people, man. I'm like I'm um, you know, I would like for people who want to find who want to buy uh in the in the in the metal fabrication and manufacturing space to just reach out, man. Like I try to um. I'm I'm jumping on calls like every week for folks, man, even with my schedule. And I, you know, I talk and walk. I've even started inviting some people out to the shop who are close. Um, man, because I, I like, you know, my thing is I would rather tell you where I went wrong than watch you get it wrong. You know, so you know, what people can do for me is just let me know what makes what they want to see more of. Uh, because I am trying to get better with threads and all that good stuff because sometimes it's kind of tough man i can only come in and talk a little shit and be on my way but i want to do more threads especially on the due diligence side for buying um you know shops and whatnot i like really 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 want to get into that uh because i want to help you know s and buyers especially in the manufacturing side you know avoid the pitfalls that i did especially with the equipment quality assurance, um, supply chain, stuff like that, because that'll, that'll take you out of the game before you even start. So uh, I want to I want to push that a lot more. I'll uh, be sure to include a link to your Twitter in the show notes. Uh, Josh, I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, man. No problem, brother. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Your listenership helps me better educate people like you and the rest of our nation's military, both past and present, on building a successful life outside of military service. If you're looking for more ways the top vets are leading more effective lifestyles, building businesses, and using the resources designed specifically for you, press here for a selection of some of the best clips. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel to stay up to date, and I will be talking with you soon.